Hey, what's going on? It's John, and it's time for the JMart Cast for Monday, March 21st. What's going on? How are ya? Friends and family, thanks again for joining me another week. Uh, happy St. Patty's Day, first of all. Also, happy, uh, where is it, Vernal Equinox, I believe. Uh, we made it, guys. We made it through the winter. We're on the other side. Things are going to get better from now on. Weather's going to get better. Maybe only one or two more snowstorms before we're done with that, too. So, yes, congrats to us. So happy having had a few days of, like, nice spring weather, letting me and the family to get out and, you know, explore the parks nearby and just have a nice time together. I hope you've been able to take advantage of the nice weather as well and do that yourselves. As I always stay, stay as I always say, stay active. And the best way, the simplest way, is just to get outside and start walking and exploring your surroundings, and you know, finding out what's around you, what's near you, what kind of cool parks are there, what kind of cool businesses are there. Are there any that are still open? <laughs> oh yeah, the other thing is uh, congratulations on making it out of the restrictions. I believe I'm, I'm recording this a little late. It's actually Monday that I'm recording this. I was hoping to have it recorded yesterday and out by today, but was too tired by the end of the day to get this going so i'm doing it now but as of today the mask mandates are over so that's excellent news Uh, haven't seen haven't been outside too too much to um tell if i've noticed a big difference in people's behavior or not all i've been all i've done today is go to jujitsu so far uh which uh was good and i went to jujitsu twice last week actually three times if i think about it because i went yesterday for the open mat roll as well yeah, it's been a good week of training. The two jujitsu classes, the one uh, class we went, I went to was on Monday, I believe, or maybe it was Wednesday. I think it was Monday, actually. We were learning like sh- shrimping out and escaping when you're on your back, when someone's got, um, you know, got a hold of you. And I guess the main lesson that day was to kind of like use your shoulders to kind of walk away from the person. Like as you're, as you're on the ground on your back and your opponent's kind of got your upper body bound with, you know, their weight before shrimping and kind of pushing the person off you to get away. It's a good idea to kind of move away by walking on your shoulders, like away from the opponent and then kind of explosively shrimping out basically creating space and then exploding to create even more space so you can escape so that was that was a good lesson i'm I'm glad i kind of remember that one now and i can try to incorporate that as much as possible and then the other that was a gi class so we had to wear the uniforms and then i went on thursday and that was a no gi class and then for that one we learned this move called the long step back and for that one it's kind of like imagine you're again uh facing your opponent so that you're on top of them but you're behind the person's uh, legs if you've got like the person's knees bent and you're kind of hugging the legs uh, that way you can kind of fall to one side while still hugging the legs and then just do a long step back with your foot on the outside to get around it's hard to explain uh, (laughs) or describe with just words but it's a good technique for basically getting past the legs, which normally would be defending and trying to stop you from getting around. And yeah, then did the uh, Sunday afternoon, noon, Sunday afternoon class, um, not class, just uh, open mat roll. Did five rolls, five five minute rolls, so 25 minutes in total with one minute breaks in between. Uh, it was a uh, it was good. I had the first three rolls with like upper belt people a little bit more experienced and we kind of went easy. And then the final two rolls was against this one uh, white belt who I'm used to training with from my noon classes that I normally go to. And he's like very aggressive and always like trying as hard as he can and not taking it easy, not saving his energy. So after two rolls with him, I was just like, so done. I was like, no, I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I'm done. I'm leaving. Uh, yeah. Anyway, what else happened this week? Uh, of course, St. Patty's Day happened, and I hung out with some friends on Saturday for that. Uh, Saturday, early afternoon, wife and I and our youngest daughter went over to my buddy's house, who was having a few friends over for for St. Patty's Day. We had a few beers. I brought my bottle of cognac, because beer doesn't really sit well with me, so 
I'm just I just have little sips of cognac instead to <laughs> feel like I'm participating but not you know drinking the beer and then it was just nice to see a bunch of friends one of my friends who recently got uh, married announced having a baby which is awesome very supportive of that very happy for them uh, and yeah it was just a nice get together my oldest son was uh at my uh in-laws house for the weekend friday we dropped them off and they came back with him on sunday afternoon and we had a nice dinner together i made some pretty sweet meatballs actually and i'm gonna save the recipe and do that again but it was really good i had the meatballs cooking in some tomato sauce which i had kind of uh, i guess flavored with uh, some nice sauteed onions and garlic and then i had um, some broth that I made, some bone broth that I made that I mixed in there with it. And then that together with the fat from the meatballs, uh, it, it just mixed very nicely. Plus with like the seasoning to taste, you know, salt and pepper and all that stuff. It, it, it was, it was perfect. It was, it was very delicious. Highly recommend, uh, mixing some tomato sauce with, uh, with bone broth that it, it gives it a nice deep flavor that lasts, uh, not lasts, but that tastes, uh, really good. All right, what else do we want to talk about this week? I don't know if there's anything else that comes to mind. I will bring it back up, but I'm going to kind of follow the same format I did last week where I found a cool thread that I liked, and I'll kind of read it and give my thoughts about it and basically comment on it. So here's what we're going to start. We're going to talk about today. So I'm going to read a thread from the same person who I had read a thread from last week, this uh guy named P.D. Mangan. His uh, Twitter handle is Mangan150, 150, 150 with new, uh, numbers, so 150. And so here's what he's talking about in today's thread. He's talking about plants. And he's saying, plants, like all living things, don't want to be eaten. Yes, very true. Animals don't want to be eaten. Plants don't want to be eaten too. And he goes on to say, if you want to eat an animal, it can fight back with teeth and claws or run like the wind to escape. However, plants can't. So what do plants use? They use chemical warfare. Yeah, this is a concept that I don't know why I didn't think of earlier, but once I came across it, it totally clicked and made sense in my mind from an evolutionary perspective. It, it's very much in line with that uh, kind of thinking. Anyways, moving on. He says, plants make toxins designed to poison plant predators. That doesn't mean it's necessarily harmful to eat plants. They have health benefits, especially when the plant in question, plants in question are coffee, tea, wine, chocolate. The benefit comes from hormesis. So he goes on to say, hormesis is this beneficial health effect that comes from exposure to a toxin or stress, such as exercise, fasting, solar radiation, or alcohol. And it's a short, acute amount of stress. It's not a long-lasting chronic stress. And your body just responds by making itself more resilient to that short burst of stress, right? Now, the thread by this uh, P.D. Mangan guy goes on to say, but in my opinion, you reach limits with green smoothies slash juices. It's one thing to eat plants, but the blender juicer was only invented 100 years ago, not exactly ancestral. Concentrating a pound or two of plants with a blender and downing it gets into the toxic zone. Now, like, I think that's a little bit strong to say that, but I do think there's some, like, um, weight behind a statement like that because, you know, there's people are, um, or people are allergic or sensitive to different compounds found in plant matter at different degrees, something that's a lot of like somebody, you know, might be really sensitive to peanuts, of course, we know that one, or somebody might be fine eating it. And that goes across the board for everything you might find in plant matter. Now, if we think about it, all the plant matter that all the plants that we can eat today is something are plants that have been domesticated over a long period of time, right? They didn't, they weren't always necessarily uh, edible. And through domestication, we've been able to whatever decrease the amount of uh, these uh, toxins found in plants to levels that for most people they're fine 
they're fine to have that level of exposure. Now, you know, there's always, like I said, variation from person to person. So even though for most people it's fine, there's always a few um, outliers that are much more sensitive. So you have to just keep that in mind. And personally, I remember when I used to do a lot of, uh, like I would do these kale shakes, I would have a lot of shakes, like these green smoothies with a bunch of veggies. And I thought I was doing good with that. And it seemed like I was, but one thing I'll, you know, share now is that I would do that. And it's, it seemed like I would have to go to the bathroom, like a lot <laughs> from doing that. Where and like, I used to joke around that, like those smoothies would open the floodgates. So I don't know if that necessarily was good for me or not. Right. It's kind of, you know, interesting to think about that. And after I read this thread, I came across this other tweet from this person, this, um, Sangeeta Iyer in her bio, it says, after, after 15 years of diet experiments, I now help people with the science of eating right, low-carb nutrition, strength, strength training advocate. Her uh, Twitter handle is Sayer, S-A-A-I-Y-E-R. And she had this interesting question that she posed on Twitter. She says, I have a genuine question for all Indians who are vegetarian. How many of you fart, feel bloated, have irritable bowel syndrome after you eat chana, chahole. Uh, those are dishes made with uh, chickpeas, chana and chahole. I hope I'm saying those right, right? Rajma. And I looked up Rajma. That's uh, uh, kidney beans, I believe. Yeah, red kidney beans. And then the last one was chali. I don't, I'm not saying that pro right, right, probably. It's C H A W L I, chowli, maybe. And those are beans, uh, like black eyed pe beans, black eyed peas, it says. When I when I just Googled it or searched it, I did not use Google. <laughs> I used DuckDuckGo, although I need to switch DuckDuckGo as well because ever since the whole Russia thing, Russia-Ukraine war thing, DuckDuckGo has been doing some uh, suspect things. Anyway, back to what I was talking about. So this lady saying like to Indian people who are vegetarian, like, do you feel like you're really bloated? You need to fart a lot. You have irritable bowel syndrome from eating these foods, like these legumes that people always say that uh, are good for you. You should be eating. And a lot of the responses when you read, like, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Like some, some one person says, I'm scared of those things. Uh, some people say, I recall the horrors of these foods. The horrors these foods did to me when I used to consume them, thinking they were healthy. Evenings were spent in the washroom, multiple trips. Uh, multiple trips in the office to had to slyly go and come <laughs> come back. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now, some people say I soak them overnight, then throw that water away, then pressure cook with a pinch of baking soda and then throw that water away as well. And while making it, I use clove and cinnamon and grated ginger, garlic and chilies. And I do not get any bloating or gas or irritable bowel syndrome doing this technique. So, you know, there, there is certain things that humans have figured out to help make these foods more palatable, more, di more digestible. So there, there's, you have to look into these techniques and see if they work for you, right? For some people they do, but not, not for everybody. Now, one other person did say, if you don't soak them overnight and put a lot of ginger and garlic in it, that's what you're going to get. And then the original poster, this, uh, Sangita Ayer had said, I have tried that. So, you know, it, 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 some, for some people it works, for some people it doesn't. Uh, yeah, let me know what you think. Uh, do you get um, any bloating or irritable bowel syndrome from eating these legumes that are supposed to be like really good for you? Or, or do you get the, or are you fine? Anyways. Second thread I want to talk about is Bitcoin related. So before we get onto the thread, let's do our regular Bitcoin update. Let's see. We are in block height 728,393. Currently, the price of Bitcoin is trading at $40,962 for US dollars. For one US dollar, you can get 2,442 Satoshis. Satoshis are the smallest unit of Bitcoin. One Bitcoin can be divided, subdivided into 100 million Satoshis. By the way, if you want to buy Bitcoin and you don't have an exchange yet, check out the link in the, in the description for um, a referral to ShakePay, which is 
a Canadian exchange that I use and I recommend. Give it a shot. Let me know what you think. Uh, let's see. The price of Bitcoin for the day is down about a percent. For the week, up about five and a half percent. For the month, up two percent. For the year, down 28 percent. And for five years, up nearly 4,000 percent. Yeah. So Bitcoin. Why is it good? Well, the price is good, but as I always say, the price is not what matters. Uh, what matters are the things about Bitcoin that make it censorship resistant, that make it immutable, that make it permission uh, permissionless. Anyone can use it without a permission. That's what's great about it. It's like these rules, right? Rules about money that are applied the same way on everybody, right? Imagine if gravity was applied differently to different people. Right, it wouldn't it wouldn't wouldn't seem fair, right? Like, <laughs> but but for some reason, something almost as important as gravity, money in our lives, is is treated like that, where where it's um, a case of different people being affected differently. You know, there's a money printer that this these central banks have privy to, and the people closest to the central banks are the ones that get to benefit from the new money that gets printed, that gets issued by them, wherein regular people who have no idea that this is happening are saving their money, right, and having it debased by having new money being printed all the time, especially with new crises happening, right? First, there was the pandemic. Now it's the war in Ukraine. There's always need for more money to fix new problems. So endlessly regular people are hurt by this decision to print new money whereas the people who own assets and who are closest to the money spigot <laughs> the printer of the money those people benefit and so if you want to get out of that system you want to opt out i recommend exchanging your fiat dollars for bitcoin now the thread that i want to talk about today has to do with Bitcoin storage, right? So you have a wallet and what a wallet is, is the way I've described it before, it's kind of like an email. An email's not for money, of course, it's for information, but it's a good analogy. Now, if we think of the email, we have the email address and a password. Now, the email address is something that everyone has access to. And by having access to the email address, everyone can send emails to that. But only the person holding the password to the email address can open up the email and read the messages that are being sent. Now, a wallet is similar to an email in that a wallet has a public key and a private key. And the public key is this address that everyone has access to, everyone can see, and everyone can send money or Bitcoin to. And the private key is like the password. So with the password, only the email owner has access to the password. And with that password, they can access and read the email. And with private keys, it's very similar. Only the owner of the wallet has access to the private keys. And with the private keys, they can spend the Bitcoin by sending it to other Bitcoin wallets. Now, the private key itself is like this long string of numbers and letters and it's stored on a device that you have the wallet on so that device can use those private keys to do whatever transactions you want to now in case you lose that device you will have a seed phrase associated with the wallet that can recover the private keys for you and the seed phrase is usually either a set of 12 or 24 numbers that basically unlocks the private keys and you can use a different wallet provider to uh, recover your wallet even if you like physically lost the original device that it was it was on so it's very cool a little hard to explain hopefully you've kept up with that now here is the thread that i wanted to read regarding a seed phrase seed phrases here it is so this is a thread by the account at parman underscore the <laughs> interesting anyway uh, he says bitcoin storage tips 
your seed phrase, usually 12 or 14, 24 words, produces virtually limitless list of Bitcoin addresses. The collection of these addresses is your wallet. They can be reproduced on any device using the same seed phrase. And he goes through a bunch of uh, uh, devices that are specifically Bitcoin wallets. There's cold, cold card, Trezor, uh, Ledger. Those are like the three main ones. If you lose your hardware wallet or the manufacturer goes out of business, it sh should not be a disaster because you should have backed up your seed words and kept them hidden somewhere. Using the words, you can regenerate your wallet on any BIB39 compliant hardware wallet, which is most of them. So I don't know what BIB39 is. I think it has to do with like the type of addresses that the seed phrase produces. Don't quote me on that, but it's not important. But the most important thing is, is whenever you start a new wallet, it, if it's like a, a non-custodial wallet, which means that the Bitcoin on that wallet is under your direct control, in those cases, you will be given a seed phrase, which you should write down on a piece of paper and then have some way of saving that or storing that somewhere safe where it's not going to get damaged. Some people even write it into <laughs> steel. But that seed phrase is very important to keep and maintain for just in case something happens and the device is broken, stolen, the company no longer supports it, has gone out of business like they say in this example, you can restore it on whatever exists currently. Now, okay, the thread goes on. Important to understand is that your seed words are highly sensitive. Anyone who gains access to them does not need to break into your hardware wallet. They simply enter the words into their own hardware wallet and send all your Bitcoin to their own wallet. So yeah, that's very important. Keep that in mind. Don't show your seed phrase to anybody. Another thing to appreciate is that hardware wallets do not hold any Bitcoin. It's just a basically a digital safe for your seed words, which like open up your um, private key, like I already said. Yet another thing to appreciate is that the software your hardware wallet connects to typically shows you one address at a time to receive new coins, but you actually have limitless addresses and a list of change addresses too. But these companies hide these details from the user to make the experience easier. The downside is that it keeps the power of Bitcoin hidden. There are better software out there for using Bitcoin, such as Sparrow Wallet and Electrum. These are two examples he gives. I recommend checking this guy out. He's got a, a website called armontheparmon.com, A-R-M-A-N, the P-A-R-M-A-N.com. Anyway, seems like he's got a bunch of cool Bitcoin articles on how to use wallets. So yeah, with that, I've come to the end of the podcast. Thank you everybody for listening. If you've got any questions, please hit me up on social media at jmartfit on Instagram and Twitter. Look forward to hearing from you. And as always, stay active, be grateful. Jmart out. <laughs>